And we are continuing our series of broadcasts with unsung hero of the Guardian of Devotion Press, Bhaktivedya Mahayogi. Good evening, boys and girls. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, devotees, mesdames et messieurs, Herr und Herrein, senoras y senoras, senoritas, damas y caballeros, ladies and gentlemen, devotees, and children of all ages. Thanks for joining us. So we have a couple questions after our broadcast from our uh, listeners. But meanwhile, what do we do? Uh, maybe someone from the audience have questions that we can begin with, and then we'll continue with our online audience. Yes, it's uh, Leela Vati. Yes, we have a question. My question is like, uh, we all know Vaishnava, they have many good qualities, but uh, what's the different uh, Vaishnava school co good quality and uh, just the social ordinary people. ordinary people's good quality? Well, in a nutshell, the Vaishnava's good quality is he's connected to Krishna. He says, you know, Gopi Bhartu Parakamalayor Das Das Anu Das. He's a servant of the servant of the servant of Krishna. He can connect you with that higher line, and that's his good quality. All other good qualities are unimportant, really, when it comes to the absolute truth. They're like adornments or decorations. But as Prabhupada would say, they're decorations on a dead body. In the case of one who's not following Krishna consciousness. All the humility, uh, truthfulness, uh, honesty, uh, cleanliness, all these things are very good qualities. But if someone's not a devotee of Krishna, we don't really care about these qualities. I don't know if that helps. And uh, someone complained like to Papad, like your disciples are like some madman or crazy man and uh, always make some offense, offense other ones. And Papa always say, okay, forgive them, but because they have like surrounded the gurus or have some dedication. So we can, we can see like that if devotee, they, really like surrender and uh, but uh, they have something like I'm not sure I really understand if you're yes. mad and devoted yeah. <laughs> yes yes like stealing bed sheets from hotels sometimes devotees do uh, oh okay that's right well <laughs> devotees have a tendency to take things to the limit you might consider Krishna consciousness as extreme spirituality, just like there's extreme sports, uh, bungee jumping, diving out of an airplane with a parachute. So in a sense, many people look at us as being a bit more extreme. And even the devotees themselves, they tend to think, OK, Sharanagati, surrender, means I have to give everything. And everything is for Krishna. So it's OK if I take things for Krishna, or if I do uh, things that are dishonest or unclean. And I say, well, this is OK, because I'm doing it for Krishna. But you have to be very careful about this kind of thing, because you'll hurt the reputation of the devotees. Also, it's not honest, and honesty is a good quality. We expect that from a, a Vaishnava. I don't know if that really answers your question, because you were talking about d devils surrounding the guru. Like Prabhupada excused all of his disciples, someone complained, your disciples are all like a little out of control, oh. and this and that, and he excused. Yeah, he excused a lot. You know, uh, for example, uh, if you get back to the subject of books, well, we did a lot of s very strange, unusual, and unconventional things to try to support uh, whatever temple we were supporting back in the 1960s and 1970s. We sold uh, flowers, we sold incense, 
We went out into the street uh, dressed as Santa Claus with buckets of candy, telling, giving a candy to somebody and saying, you know, Mary Krishna, give a donation, you know. And uh, a, a lot of those things, well, they helped expand the movement. Um, in Los Angeles, we printed 17 volumes of Chaitanya Charitamrita in record time, something like uh, six months. They brought out the whole thing. But they needed an enormous amount of money in order to do that. And so there was a lot of pressure on devotees to collect money. Well, if we take the long view, looking back on some of these things, they damaged our reputation. People think of devotees as those people who, oh yeah, I know them. They're in the airports and they push you and they give you a flower or some incense or something. Then they want money. Um, to some extent, Prabhupada forgave a lot of that because he felt that publishing the works of Kaviraj Goswami, for example, was of a higher order. But even Prabhupada was not aware of a lot of things that uh, were going on. And the devotees had a, th a tendency, as I said, to, to push it to the limit. And uh, Guru Maharaj and Govinda Maharaj are not of that stamp. They really prefer that the devotees conduct themselves in a dignified way so that if someone sees, oh, She's a devotee of Krishna. I recognize that sari. I know who you people are. You're not the Christians over there in the Muban. You belong to the that Hare Krishna thing. Well, they're watching you. They're looking at you. And if you steal, you know, bananas from the market so you can offer that to Krishna, thinking, well, Krishna's a thief. You know, he likes to steal yogurt. So I'm going to steal some yogurt for him. Mm maybe not such a good idea. It's not good for you morally, and it's not good for the reputation of the devotees. I don't know. Does that help you? And let's move on to the questions from our audience that came from many places. Can I? Sure. May Thank I? you, Gopaki Shore, please. <laughs> OK, the first. You said that the devotees can burn out. Are there any signs of burning out that somebody's getting is burning out? And what is your advice uh, of the burnout prevention? Wow, that's a really good question. Well, evidence of burnout, uh, that's easy to spot. If you feel burned out, you probably are. If you don't notice that you're burned out, <coughs> you may be burned out. But if you feel, that's enough, I can't do this anymore, well, it's time to maybe change your activity, uh, try a different service. In the West, we're used to specializing. So if someone's a computer expert, they specialize in that and they do it all day. But sometimes it may be good to try a different activity, maybe cooking in the kitchen or seeing what's available as a service. Uh, I was just talking to Goswami Maharaj, and he told me, he was rem reminding me of a devotee named Kushikrata. He was a Sanskrit scholar. And he was saying, he talked to him recently and asked him what he was translating. And he said, it's all been translated. But he met him in a kitchen in New York washing the dishes. I mention this because uh, I met Avadut Maharaj's brother. He was washing, the, we were washing the dishes and we said hello. And he said, oh, I met Kushikrata washing dishes. And he was studying Sanskrit. And uh, he said, how come you're studying Sanskrit? He said, well, right now in the New York temple, the only service available is washing dishes or being a pundit. So he was trying to be a, a Sanskrit scholar. He thought, I want to change my engagement. So you have to see what engagements are available in the, in, the, in the temple. If you've been washing dishes every day all the time and you're tired of that, try a new activity. Try something that gives you some inspiration. But basically, you know that you're, you're feeling burnout if you don't taste the same taste that you had when you first came. You're trying everything to get back to that 
day when you first came in contact with the devotees or prasadam or the Hare Krishna mantra or what gave you that inspiration. Uh, if you're not feeling that, then it's time to look into yourself and uh, find how you can uh, relive or revive that. And if you can't do that by yourself, which often you can't, talk to the other devotees and try to get help from them. The association of devotees is everything. But like how it came for me is, uh, I don't know who asked this question, but how it came for me, uh, er, like the growth is beyond the, the comfort zone. Like Sridhar Maharaj said that if sportsman doesn't feel a pain in his body, maybe he's not training enough. Mm -hmm. So it's like just the question for me, am I am like stretching so this is for the growth or I'm like stretching and it's like tearing me apart. So how do you Well, yeah, Guru Maharaj like would say bad pain? Mm -hmm. Guru Maharaj would say no risk, no gain, right? So no pain, no gain. If you're not feeling some sacrifice, then how do you know that you're really giving? But it may come to you that you're working beyond your capacity and that may be dangerous, just like a battery that gets very close to running on empty. You want to recharge that battery. You don't want to just keep uh, sucking all the life out of it. So we like to think that by giving everything, by giving every last drop of energy that we have, we'll be re-energized. Uh, and that may be true up to a point, but you need to be careful and see what your real capacity is. Some devotees can give more than others. Some uh, acharyas are capable of traveling all over the world, publishing books, man managing temples, having thousands of disciples. And other devotees, they may have one or two disciples and that's enough. So, you know, you have to try to understand what your capacity is and to really know that, well, you should pray. You should look within yourself and, you know, if you can't meet with your Guru Maharaj directly, uh, try to talk to him uh, through prayer. I want to deepen this, but I will ask some more questions so our listeners feel engaged. Do you really recall any characters or sections in the books which were particularly particularly hard to write? Particularly hard to write. The whole thing, from beginning to end, it was incredibly difficult because, well, I gave the example of Ganesh, and it's a good example because <coughs> writing is different fr from speaking. Uh, a good speaker can captivate an audience by transmitting emotion, enthusiasm, the music of the voice, um, gestures, eye movements, uh, and speak in the same language as the people who are uh, listening. Uh, an expert speaker will adjust his speech to the audience. But when you write, uh, you're constrained by uh, the format of words or literature, and you have to be careful that everything you put down makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, you shouldn't really publish it. So if something really made sense to me, then I would put it down, just as Ganesh had to understand every shloka that Vyas spoke to him before he wrote it down. I felt the need to be able to understand it myself before passing it on to Goswami Maharaj for further revision or uh, publishing. Uh, because if I don't understand it, and even though I may be a novice, I'm immersed in Krishna consciousness, how will the ordinary person or even a scholar be able to penetrate what's being put down? So uh, everything that we published, I had to think about very carefully. So it was all, there was nothing really easy about uh, that work. I would carry around two or three paragraphs in my head for about a week and, th and think, die to live. What does this mean? Why does he keep saying it? Die to live. Is he saying that when we die, we're reincarnated? Is that it? The body dies, but the soul lives on. Or, no, he's saying 
you die as a karmi to become a jnani. You die as a jnani to become a mystic. Uh, you die as a mystic yogi to become a bhakta. You die as a karma mishra bhakta to go higher and understand really what you're doing. You die there to enter the world of rasa. You die, you know, as a shantarasic devotee to present. Is that what he's talking about? die to live. He had all these different uh, phrases that he would put out again and again. Reality is by itself and for itself. And these were things that he carefully, uh, you know, considered. So for me to make sure that Guru Maharaj's message was understood, uh, I felt I had to really understand it myself. Of course, when you get to the loving search for the lost servant, I'm looking over that book again, and it reminds me of a talk that Guru Maharaj gave again and again and again. I don't remember who all the principals were. I, it may have been Goswami Maharaj and Yajivar Maharaj. But he gave this talk where he was describing something from the Bhagavad Gita, something very confidential, something very high with Goswami uh, Maharaj. The original, the Gaudiya Mat Goswami Maharaj. And uh, both of them were astonished by what they were discovering. And Yajivar Maharaj came by and said, you know, what are you talking about? What are you laughing at? And Goswami Maharaj said, if I told you, you would faint. So Kaviraj Goswami, also in the Chaitanya Charitamrita somewhere, he talks about poetry. And it's interesting because beginning with Kaviraj Goswami, you have a, a renaissance of uh, Bengali poetry. Before that, the real important books are written in Sanskrit. And I've heard that even Jiva Goswami had some doubt about putting the uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita in Bengali instead of Sanskrit because if you put something in the vernacular language or the vulgar language, the classic language starts falling into uh, disuse. Just as when Dante put the uh, Divine Comedy in uh, Italian, uh, Italian started becoming more and more popular as a, a literary language and people left Latin behind. Or when El Cid is written in Spanish, the Latin Spanish that they wrote and spoke in uh, the Iberian Peninsula in the 9th and 10th century fell into disuse and Spanish came into its own. So in the same way, when Kaviraj Goswami publishes the Chaitanya Charitamrita, uh, taking that as a point of departure, after that, there's this resurgence of uh, classical uh, Bengali literature. So Kaviraj Goswami, in his own right, not only is giving us uh, something deep about Mahaprabhu, but He's also a great poet. And he says there in his poetry, he says, uh, what use uh, is poetry? Um, it, it's like an arrow. He says, poetry is like an arrow. What use is it if it penetrates the heart, but it doesn't make the head spin? And that's a really good line, right? His poetry is like an arrow. What, what good is it if it penetrates the heart, but it doesn't make the head spin? So what Guru Maharaj is giving in the loving search for the lost servant, not only does it penetrate the heart, but it makes the head spin. And I was reading, again, a little bit from that uh, Golden Reflections where uh, Govinda Maharaj is pointing out. Some of these things that uh, Guru Maharaj is giving, like loving search for the lost servant, he's giving in his final years. These are his last thoughts, and perhaps his most penetrating. But in the early years, he's giving something else. So he said, it's not enough just to go to the last part of the book and read that. You have to know the chapters that came before that. You shouldn't go to the last lesson in the book without first studying lesson one, lesson two, lesson three. So the devotees asked Govinda Maharaj, he said, well, what's lesson one then? And he said, prapanajivanamrita, sharanagati, surrender. The real thing is surrender. Right, getting back to where that ruchi is coming from, or, you know, am I really burning out? You know, well, if you're burning out, try to look inside yourself and find uh, a deeper level of surrender that you can offer. You know, 
because that's the basis of Krishna consciousness. Surrender means, uh, even in the 12-step programs that they have in Alcoholics Anonymous and things like that, they say you're supposed to recognize a higher power and surrender to it, right? So the idea is to surrender to Krishna and his devotees. And by doing so, then you begin to enter into a special world where you become privy to all this uh, confidential uh, knowledge. But I'm sorry, I've forgotten your question. That's it. That's a very good answer. And I'd like to ask another one. Uh, <laughs> concerning your uh, long days and years spending with Srila Gaswai Maharaj, uh, the next question is, does Gaswami Maharaj have any sweet spots which, uh, with the help of which you can pacify him when he's in anger? Does he have any what? Any spots you can use, like in his personality? Soft to <laughs> like soft spot. Does he have a soft spot? Yeah. What, what are you talking spot? about? He's, he's a sweetheart. He's a teddy bear. <laughs> 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 he's all softness. Well. You know, my particular gift in dealing with him is that I can listen to him. So perhaps that would be advisable for you. You know, sometimes when someone ha is bursting with something important to say, if you cut them off and cut them off, it makes them uh, more explosive. So why not listen? Maybe he's trying to tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> Car for today. Car. <laughs> One o'clock. That's it? I can no. go? Uh, and the uh, last question we've got as a feedback after yesterday broadcast. Uh, the question about the whole history of Hare Krishna movement that you was the, uh, evidencing. Uh, and you was uh, in the Hare Krishna movement almost from the beginning. It's on the West. So uh, you saw how it was developing. And what are, in your opinion, advantages and disadvantages of the Hare Krishna movement today? Okay, well, f in, in the first place, I was not a participant okay. in the early Hare Krishna movement, okay? The early movement began in New York. And that was really... The 1960s, I think Prabhupada first came in 1968. So I joined in 76, that was eight years later. And a lot really happened uh, in those years. So I can't really take credit for, uh, you know, being a participant. I, I would say I was in the middle years or, you know, when Prabhupada was in the apogee of his powers, when he published the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Uh, So what significance does the Hare Krishna movement have today? Uh, like what are the good and bad habits or the tendencies you can see? I can't really uh, comment on that because I don't really know the Hare Krishna movement. I know the devotees of Chiang Mai, uh, Thailand a little bit, and I've heard something about uh, the devotees in Russia. I've seen photos of temples in India. The Krishna Balaram Mandir, uh, wow, it's so much bigger. I remember when Prabhupada's Samadhi Mandir was a very humble affair. Even uh, the Chaitanya Saraswat Mat, uh, I've seen photos, it's huge. So I think perhaps uh, the devotees are more mature. They understand uh, things on a deeper level. Uh, they're more learned. When uh, Goswami Maharaj is telling me something about his history and how he connected, uh, when he first came to the movement, the most important book we had was the Sri Ishopanishad, you know, which is Om Purnam Ada Purnam Idam. He was knocked out. He thought, this is brilliant. Wow, Sanskrit. Well, we've come a long way since the publication of. Uh, a very simple Upanishadic text. Now we have Brihad Bhagavatamrita, Govinda uh, Lilamrita, Gov you know, Gita Govinda, all these very high and confidential 
Vaishnava literatures. These were not available when we started out, but we had the advantage that we had Srila Prabhupada. So our faith was with him. We had a little guru bhakti, and we saw him and thought, he knows what he's doing. I want to follow this person. So we perhaps did not have the full experience of hearing Krishna's flute and then meeting him or some such thing. But by coming in contact with Srila Prabhupada, you felt, I'm closer to God here. And uh, the same with Sridhar Maharaj. We were fortunate to enjoy that. Um, nowadays, I think the devotees are probably better organized, um, more mature. They have a better business model. Uh, from what I've seen, they're very sensible. The devotees here in Chiang Mai, everyone is uh, well prepared, well educated. I've met tr uh, people who can translate Russian into English, uh, IT consultants, uh, full dome pro specialists, uh, people who understand how to run software for planetariums, uh, uh, temple managers from Brazil who can uh, speak English, uh, Portuguese, uh, a little Russian perhaps, uh, Sanskrit and Bengali. Uh, everyone is very highly qualified. And you know, when we were first starting out, like for example in Los Angeles, sometimes we would give refuge to people who came in off the street and they needed food and they needed shelter and they may, be a, they may have been drug users or drunks or something like that. And they saw us as the, their last hope to get a meal and you know, stay for a few days. So we were on a perhaps more primitive level than what I'm seeing today. I'm sitting in a studio surrounded by uh, high-tech computers and I'm on, online in Russia, China, London, Brazil, wherever people uh, watch theistic media studio productions. So it's uh, an incredible change and we hope that in the future uh, our movement will grow. So I think what we see now is a greater maturity And ado adopting so many like knowledge and the things from the uh, like mundane science or what usually we perceive as a mundane world, uh, how do you see what's, what the people still dig from the Krishna consciousness? Because like all like Vedic education, it doesn't seem so cool compared to. Uh, well, that gets today. back to what I was saying the other day. We went on Hari Nam, and as we're going through the street, banging on the drum and playing the cartels, just lots of people who are smiling and going, yeah, yeah, and dancing along. But some people look at us like, <gasps> ah, get away from me, Satan, you know, kind of a thing. And, uh, it struck me that 40 years after, you know, I, I first saw the devotees in Los Angeles, uh, we're still weird, we're still strange. And what a good thing that is, that even the strangest weirdest people are accepted but they say you know they see the Hare Krishna devotees and they think you guys are really strange so that must be a good thing because if you look at the world around us and how it's in decay and corruption just look at Bangkok I don't want to say any you know anything political I guess but, but you I, I understand there's protests and people are in the street and they're angry hmm so things must not be going so good out there. I think it's good to be a little weird, a little different. But that's difficult for uh, the devotees. It's difficult to be different. It's difficult to uh, believe in God in a different way than other people. But, you know, have, the, have faith in your uh, convictions, you know. As Guru Maharaj used to say, follow your star. You know, sometimes we would ask him too many questions and he would just say, follow your star, you know. <laughs> like, okay, that's good. I can go with that. What does that mean exactly? It means that Guru Maharaj had faith that Shraddha leads to Ruchi, that if you start with some inkling of Krishna consciousness and what that is, 
you will move towards a position where you can taste it a little bit. And once you taste that, you'll, you'll search that out wherever it may be. And uh, probably there's some poem that he knew, but he liked that, follow your star. It means if you're lost at sea, you can follow the planets, but the planets are wanderers. That's what the word planet means. Venus is never in the same place twice. It's always moving around in the heavens. The North Star is fixed. So if you take a reading of the North Star and follow that, you'll arrive at your destination. So uh, the high essence of Krishna consciousness uh, it's like a star. Once you locate that, if you can follow that, it will get you through all these little difficulties like burnout, uh, opposition from uh, the people in the street or your mother's friends. You know, it will get you through all that. So follow your star. I, one time I was talking to him, we, were, we asked him a lot of questions and he looked at me and he said, you know. Just like that. You know, like, you know what you have to do. Like, don't ask me anymore. I've given enough. It should be clear by now. It's, but it's just like my doctor says, don't eat salt. Stop eating salt. It's bad for your blush, you know, bad for your blood pressure. Watch your heart. And I know I'm not supposed to put more salt on my food, but I can't stop doing it. I'm addicted. It's very difficult. I know theoretically that uh, I know what's good for me. But in practice, sometimes things are very difficult. So we know what we're supposed to be doing. We have the whole sadhana bhakti, uh, cheto darpana marjanam, chant Hare Krishna and be happy. You know? We know what we're supposed to be doing, so do it. But, mm, you know. It's like trying to give up salt. It's, sometimes it's difficult. But, you know, believe in Krishna and follow your star. So what else do you have? As it was said by one, by one wise man, it's simple but not easy. <laughs> I like that. I like that's very Yogi Berra. Yogi Berra was an American baseball player. He, he said, you can, you can see a lot just by watching. He's <laughs> Captain Achievedness. <laughs> what? You like that? C Captain Obviousity. <laughs> I don't know. He was the manager of the New York Yankees. He also said, it, it's, it's not over till it's over. <laughs> you know? He was fi those are called, you know, Yogi Berra-isms. You can, you can Google it. We'll have time for this later, but now we have a chance to ask some more questions. And uh, in one of the books of Shidhar Maharaj, oh. I've uh, and met and this Don't forget, pick up your copy of The Loving Search for the Lost Servant we'll as we'll soon as possible. <laughs> uh, there was one very brilliant point that I uh, met about usually yogis, they try to like, uh, like avoid... Uh, it's like dirtiness or like distraction and all the thing. But in one of the books, it was said, all your craziness, all your strength, all your wishes, you try to connect uh, and engage in the Krishna consciousness. You, like you try to turn them on the, to the Krishna, like not to the matter, but to the Krishna. Well, for example, one of the things that we did at the uh, Guardian of Devotion Press, um, we published a magazine. We tried to make some money by publishing a magazine. Uh, it was called the Harmonist Magazine. And um, the idea was to create something that had content that sort of tended towards Krishna consciousness without spelling it all out directly so that we could uh, involve a lot of people in buying our magazine, subscribing to it, we'd get a mailing list so we'd know everybody who was on the list and then gradually introduce them to something deeper. So 
In order to publish the magazine, we had to write articles for it. And Goswami Maharaj, he asked me to write the articles. So in addition to publishing all these books, I was writing articles for this magazine. And uh, I wrote something like 10 or 15 articles for every magazine, but he said, well, change the name. Don't put your name, put a different name. So I had, you know, instead of, you know, Michael Dolan, I had something like Mickey Dillon or Dylan Michaels or, you know, D. Michaels, or, you know. I used different names. Uh, and in, in order to, pr to produce that, I had to read newspapers and magazines. But while I was reading the newspaper and reading the magazine, I'm, I'm thinking furiously, how can I find some connection here with what Guru Maharaj said? Well, he said, die to live. Here's something. And so I began converting my thinking processes over into how to uh, think of everything in a Krishna conscious way. It was an exercise. It was like rewiring your brain. So uh, as you go further down the path, you should get to the point where everything reminds you of Krishna. Just like as Govinda Maharaj was saying, he became angry and he was thinking about leaving the mat. So, but first he had to ask permission from the trees because of course they're part of the holy dham, they're sacred, they're holy, they're personalities. And as he engaged himself with the trees, the mango tree, you know, what other tree do we have? The banana trees, the bamboo, uh, the champak tree. So he'd have, he'd think about, well, you know, this champak tree, it's rooted in the soil where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu walked with his kirtan party. And in this way, Everything he did was rooted in uh, his experience of Krishna consciousness, Navadweep, ultimately Guru Maharaj, Vrindavan. And so if you can do that, that will really help you. It's, it's more difficult if you pick some kind of engagement which is completely disconnected and try to think, well, I'll do this and get some money and then I'll give the money to the temple. That's more like... A, you know, karma bhakti, it's, 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 it's more difficult. And you were talking about taking pseudonyms. Many times I've uh, heard about somebody reading a book like uh, Sri Guru and His Grace, and like, who wrote this book? Like, who wrote this book? How can I connect with him? Like, w the thing about taking credit, usually people say, like, you always put a link on your job in the internet so people can like go search more or uh -huh. connect so how how do you look back on this like being well no name? you know taking credit is a double-edged sword because by taking credit you also take the karma so the credit is really to guru maharaj so if this series is called the unsung hero you know but the real unsung hero is sridhar maharaj because People forget who he was and what he gave and his message. Uh, so even his books are not so much read as, as spoken about. So you know, I'm not really, I'm not really interested in taking credit uh, for my work in compiling and editing and doing these kinds of things. I didn't write that. You know, Guru Maharaj wrote it. We were channeling him. But as a sannyasi, as a preacher, it helps you if you have a book, if you can walk in and say, yes, this is my book. Everybody listen to me because I published something. And if, they take, if, if that's taken away from you, and you walk in and say, hey, I have this book, and they look at, mm, what book? No, that's not yours. <laughs> Who are you? Uh, it, it makes your preaching engagement uh, more challenging because you have to just walk in and by what you say and what you do uh, hypnotize people and engage them in you know harikata until the point where they go okay this is harikata I'm pleased hit them with the substance yeah but you know if if somebody gives just like Goswami Maharaj he's giving me a platform he's saying okay uh, go in and talk to the people on television. Just that he did that, 
Uh, that's enough of an introduction. But it's nice if somebody gets up and says, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and now, you know. But, but if we become too involved in taking credit, that, go, that goes towards what's called pratishta. And pratishta, it's a form of ego. It means, you know, look at me. And uh, sometimes devotees get involved in that because, I don't know, maybe human beings are naturally competitive. And we like to uh, get status with other people and say, hey, I went to India. Did you go to India? No. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, uh, but this is not, this is not a contest, okay? It's not a race to see who gets to Goloka quickest, you know? The important thing is the journey. So talking about the journey, Oh, just okay. I'm going to no, sing no, a just song just on the ukulele. No, no. It's yeah. You just are revealing no? all the secrets. You had a question? No. Go ahead. How <laughs> talking about the no, journey. You're always saying like, this, you see this little thing? Not talking about ukulele. This brought me here. Yeah, talking about the journey. <laughs> yes, talking about the journey. I'm sorry. Talking about the journey. <coughs> you always say, look, this like, little electronic piece, you see it's crappy, but it brought me here. Like you see, little crappy YouTube video, Goswami Maharaj posted comment on it, and now I'm here in Thailand. How can you explain this? Uh, this is inexplicable, okay? I cannot explain it. Th the proof that it's inexplicable is that if I very carefully and logically explain exactly what I've been doing for the last four weeks to anybody. No one will believe it. That's another problem I have like with getting credit for things that I do. I do things that are impossible for anybody to believe. So if I tell people, okay, here's, here's what happened. I was sitting patiently in Mexico in San Miguel de Allende and I, I thought, I'm going to make a little video with my ukulele. And I did. The video is about, it's a song called Beyond the Sea, which I like because it's like, oh, you sons of nectar, son, sons of the nectarine ocean sea. Or beyond, you know, this mundane material world, there's a higher world. I don't know. Also, it reminds me of uh, my mother, you know because she used to like the song in French, but I can't sing it in French. I put this on the YouTube, and uh, a few weeks later, I checked my messages. There's a message from Goswami Maharaj saying, is that you? And I looked at it and I thought, is that you? <laughs> and I didn't answer him at first because I was a little chicken. I was like, rock, rock, rock. Where is this going to lead, you know? I know. I know if I just click on that, <laughs> it's going to change my life. Somebody just reached out from the absolute infinite to touch me. And uh, I don't know if I can take that touch. But I thought about it, and I sent, uh, he sent me another message. He said, can you read me? Because uh, I'm wearing a, a, a captain's hat, you know? Captain, can you read me? I'm like, well, yeah, I can read you. So he sends me a, an email saying, well, come to Thailand. I'm like, yeah, of course. I had that planned. I was going to do that all the time. And here I am, you know, three or four weeks later in Chiang Mai, Thailand, surrounded by Russians and Brazilians and, you know, Mexicans and Chinese and an American or two. Uh, chanting Hare Krishna. If I tell this story to anybody, they'll just go, wait a minute, I don't believe that. Where'd you get the money? How'd you do that? You got on an airplane because, come on, it's impossible to believe. So that's why I like being with the devotees because they can do the impossible and they can believe the impossible. So, you know, I'm gonna give you a little bit of beyond the seat just for the historical record, you know. <laughs> 
You can pretend you like it or not. Hola, hola, senora, hola. Somewhere beyond the sea, somewhere waiting for me. My lover stands on golden sands and watches the ships that go sailing somewhere beyond the sea. She's there watching for me. If I could fly like birds on high. Then straight to her arms, I go sailing. It's far beyond the stars, it's near beyond the moon. I know. Just as before, happy will be beyond the sea of birth and death, and never again I'll go sailing. So. Goswami Maharaj saw that and he thought, well, he has a sense of humor, you know? So I'll give him a chance, maybe. And then uh, as I was preparing for my trip, I thought, well, let me understand. Where am I going and what am I doing? I'm going to go to Thailand. So should I learn Thai? And it, I looked at it. It's, that looks like a challenge. So I thought, well, how about Russian, you know? And I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll try to learn some Russian, you know? Maybe, uh, maybe in, in June or July, Goswami Maharaj is now telling me, okay, you know, you did this now. In June or July, you know, you should go to, uh, go to Russia. You know, I'm like, Russia? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go to Siberia, Mahaya. <laughs> It's very green. <laughs> well, go to Moscow. And I was like, well, I remember when I was in high school, there was a song I learned in high school called uh, Podmoskovnye Vichera. So I'm going to give it to you now. And then maybe we can have a little uh, kirtan. Yeah? Does anybody have a drum? <laughs> Here you are. This is uh, based on a song by Vasily Soloviev. Original with, title. With the regards to the Kiselny Temple. Hmm? With the regards to the Kiselny Temple near the Red Square. Oh, you want me to tell the joke about the bicycle? I can't hear you. You want the bicycle joke? No. I'll tell you a joke that uh, I'll tell you a joke that Goswami Maharaj told me right about about Russia. It's a really terrible joke. All right, uh, so. The one about Chinese? Are you going to ruin the joke for me? <laughs> <laughs> no jokes? No, joke, joke. Joke? Okay. <clears throat> so they're listening to uh, the radio. There's, a, there's an old saying in Russia that you should never believe anything until you hear the official denial. So if they say, we're not going to close the airport, don't worry. That's when you start to worry, <laughs> right? Don't believe anything till you hear the official denial because sometimes things are the opposite of what they say they are. So this guy's listening to the radio, and on the radio they say, um, ladies and gentlemen, comrades, comrades, tovarishchi, uh, today it's a miracle. We're giving away cars in Red Square. And so this guy calls up the radio station. He says, Tovarish, comrade, is it true? 
Pravda? It's true? You're giving away cars in, in Red Square? And uh, they say, yes, of course, comrade. It's true. Only it isn't Red Square. It's Petersburg, St. Petersburg. Oh. And it isn't cars. No. It's bicycles. Oh. And we aren't giving them away, comrade. We're stealing them. So that's ha ha ha. You know, it's a terrible joke. But, yeah, go Swami Marsh told me that. So you can you can talk to him. Nislishni saru does your shoulder. Shows ye same Stop! Moscow! <laughs> Petersburg! <laughs> Siberia! <laughs> Ukraine! <laughs> Kiev! Uh, Kiev? Uh, is it Kiev or Kiev? Yeah, Kiev? Yes. Okay. All right. So let's have a couple of. So thank you to the Russian devotees and thank you to Bobby Darren, yes, <laughs> who yeah. gave the song so that we could come here and see all these happy shining faces like the face of little Derek. Hmm? Okay, you want to play the drum and we'll Gartals. chant a little Hare Krishna and say goodbye and good luck. Dos vidanya, adios, adieu, au revoir, and see you later. We have, we have a, yeah? They're ready. Okay. Why don't you, get, can you bring me the card dolls? This is not really for care time. <laughs> yeah, this is mundane musical instrument for recreational purpose only. This, oh, oh, you asked me about stress and burnout? <laughs> this is the sign? Or this is the, the This solution. is the method. Yeah, you can remove stress with the ukulele. But not like chanting Hare Krishna. Chanting Hare Krishna, this is divine medicine. Hmm? All right, so here we go. Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunj 
Oh, the primitive. 